Before we start, I must say work is not my religion and money is not my God. What's interesting about people is that we have no problem saying how we feel and we still have the endless capacity to do the opposite of whatever we feel for any reason we feel necessary to uphold. And when it comes to work, we have no problem going back there day to day to day to day to day just so we can ultimately survive. But even with all that hustle, there doesn't seem to be much enthusiasm around the whole idea. But the title of this video is, I hate my fucking job. Show. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Sure, what's up? Um, kind of lost here. Um, I'm, I've been at my job for 15 years. Um, I absolutely despise it. And um, I, I don't know, is it selfish of me to be thinking about walking away from it and trying something new? No. Why would you feel selfish? Why does that make you uh, ask that question? I, I guess I just get nervous about it. I, I almost feel like I'm institutionalized there and um, <laughs> you know, not having to... Not, I'm having in a, a padded cell! Or anything. <laughs> but also, if you really think about the fact that we are in a world where people have to go to work, uh, how many, many people are working in jobs that don't do anything for the world or the company they're working for. One of the qualifications for your job to be a bullshit job is you know that it's really kind of a worthless job. It's not really doing anything. And like the companies have gotten so fucking big that uh, they, they end up having like departments or people running departments or extra employees that don't really need to be there at all. The, if you really want to torture a person, uh, not only give them like the job of like, you know, pouring a glass of water in an empty glass and pouring it back, but then add to it that they have to deceive their boss into thinking that they're like doing an important job or they lose their job. So these, not only are these like some corporations and companies scanning your piss to see if you're taking a substance that is allowing you to connect with home, what you actually are, they're also demanding that you spend many hours a day lying to them that you're doing work that you're not doing. Like if you're fucking efficient, you know, and this is another thing Graber writes about. Forgive me, David Graber, if in any way I misconstrue this. I read your writings stoned. But the and, and but the the um the 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 other fucking element to it that is absolutely atrocious and fucking horrible is that uh, these substances are connecting us to home. They don't want us to be in those states, and they're asking us to fucking lie all day. And you know what psychedelic means? The the etymology of psychedelic? No. It means mind manifesting or soul manifesting, right? So a psychedelic connects us potentially with the truth, what we are, our identity, right? And these companies, they're asking us to lie, to be the opposite of our identities, to wear weird a suit or, or some kind of dress code and to sit in a desk where because you're efficient, you get your job done in 45 minutes and for the next six hours, you got to sit and type and pretend that you're working knowing it, you're a person and knowing that this is like unethical you're but if you if you like go and tell your boss hey man i don't really have much to do you might get fired the boss might like in the book he cites one person because he did like a survey and he cites one person who went to her boss and she's like hey i can finish my job in two hours i need can i have other stuff to do and her boss is like don't talk about that stay quiet about that oh yeah, man, that's the fucking world we're in right now because of automation, there's less to do. Computers are making shit fast. It's, why are we, wor we're working the exact same amount of time we were when there were no computers. But you have to be there to get paid. And you have to act like you're doing something or they can you. Yeah. After about a year being locked in our houses because of this unpredictable Ponda replay, 
the coronavirus, many people did not work. Their jobs were either taken away because of health risks due to the pandemic or the subsequent risks of these health risks, eliminating business jobs. It was a tough time, a crazy time. Many people put a lot into perspective because of how fragile we began to notice life was. People were starting businesses, staying close to the people they cared about. And after things subsided, the effects of the pandemic and our relation to our preciousness in this world gave many people new meaning, especially for a handful of folks who realized that while the world was literally sick and dying, their job <laughs> couldn't care less about them. Employees. So there seemed to be a more bold response to this idea of work or jobs that prompted some folks to speak about their unwillingness to participate in organizations that firstly couldn't keep their employees safe and also had no problem replacing them during worldwide difficult times. You can say the empathy of corporate America was lost, so the people started speaking up and acting out. Anti-work became a national phenomena, with people averting their obligation to this cycle of work. Now that they had so much to evidently reconsider about work, its quote unquote sanctity and centrality in our lives. As I started to hear anti-work in the news, of course, and elsewhere, Reddit was the hub for my analysis of what this really meant to people. Overall, honey, we're tired. I mean, come the hell on over 1.6 million subscribers. Joining me now is the person who operates this anti-work group, Doreen Ford. All right, so Doreen, why do you like the idea of being home, not working, but still getting paid by corporate America? Yeah, uh, so there's some misconceptions about the movement. Um, so we're a movement where we want to reduce the amount of work that people feel like they f they're forced to to do um and so we want to still put in effort we want to put in labor um but we don't want to necessarily uh be in a position where we feel trapped you know um you just quoted from office space where that person feels very trapped in their job i think we're calling for a society where there's less of that um but yeah absolutely people still want to do things they just want to do things where they feel rewarded and they feel like they're in a good spot in their life uh and that their job respects them and stuff like that um you know there's varying so you're on the, so um, doreen but you're not being forced to work this isn't this isn't slave labor you, you've you've applied for a job you've agreed to the terms and conditions of the employment and you know you can walk away from that job at any time and quit so I don't understand yeah, really what this is about, sure. except it sounds like maybe people are just being lazy. Are you encouraging people well, sure. to be so, lazy? Um, so I think laziness is um, a virtue in a society where people constantly want you to be productive 24 seven, and it's good to have rest. Um, that doesn't mean you should be resting all the time or not putting effort into things that you care about. But I think one of the what do you think is like a work good work day? How many hours is is you know a solid work day in in your ideal right. society? Uh, sure. I mean, I think as much as people want. I mean, I personally uh, work. I have I have like a twenty twenty five hour work weeks, which I think is fairly good. Um, so I would like less work hours. Um, and what I do you do, Doreen? Oh, I'm a dog walker. A dog walker. Okay. Yes. And how? Uh, yeah. So how I old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Sure, I'm thirty. You're thirty. Okay. And is there something you want to do besides being a dog walker? Do you aspire to do anything more than dog walking, or is that kind of your your pinnacle? Uh, I I love working with dogs. If I had to do this for the rest of my life, you know, I wouldn't be super complaining. You know, dogs are wonderful animals. Uh, but I mean, I would love to teach. Uh, I would love to. Um, you teach. know, uh, work with work with people and well, stuff like that. What would that. you yeah. teach, Doreen? Uh, a philosophy mostly, philosophy. just introduction to philosophy, critical thinking, reason, stuff like that. Okay. Well, I would love to take your class, Doreen. I would just be taking notes the whole time, and you know what? A professor is a very similar schedule than something that you're imagining. So I think that actually might might work perfectly for you. Listen. Uh, I think this might not be the greatest idea, but who am I to judge? To each their own.
they say. It's a free country. Sure. Not yeah. everything's uh, free, you know. but it is a free country. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. We got to run. We got to pay the bills. I couldn't help but notice, was this man low-key agreeing with him? The anchor dude, like, in his face, it looked like he agreed with him, but couldn't, like, agree with him because he's, like, under the control of things, you know? Like, he had to play his part, but, like, he definitely agreed with him, right? Okay, moving on. Paid jobs continue to be promoted as a vital source of good health and character. The media continues obsessively to demonize the non-working scrounger and an old-fashioned work ethic maintains its anchorage in policies designed to force people off welfare and into employment. Within this political context, my central goal in this book is to argue that the time has come to challenge the work-centered nature of modern society. As it stands, work represents a highly naturalized and taken for granted feature of everyday life. The dogmatic nature of work is revealed when we consider the uncanny resilience of its ethical status, even in the face of some very troubling realities. Consider the woeful nature or failure of today's labor market to keep pace with the, with the desire for jobs that allow for self-expression and creativity. Gratifying work is a fantasy that we have all been trained to invest in ever since our teachers and parents asked us what we wanted to be when we grew up, yet most of us are confronted with scant opportunities to consolidate our ambitions in the world of paid employment, a world whose signature features are often drudgery, subordination, and exhaustion. What is also baffling is the fact that the ethical status of work has still not been significantly destabilized by our disintegrating labor, labor market. Mass unemployment, job insecurity, and low wage work are making employment an increasingly unreliable source of income, rights, and belonging. The orthodox political solution to the situation is job creation, the invention of work by creating by increasing output and expanding the economy into new sectors. However, as a range of concerned scientists and economists are now pointing out, constant growth is not only unlikely to solve the problem, but also brings with it a disturbing set of environmental and social implications. Finally, the dogmatic status of work is also graspable when we consider the extent to which we have unconsciously accommodated work's escalating dominance in our everyday lives. Work has increasingly spilled its demands into our homes, drawing upon our emotions and personalities to an extent never before seen or tolerated. As the ethic of hard work tightens its grip once again, employability becomes the motivating force of our ambitions, interactions, and education system. A side effect of this is that we, as a society, may be losing our grip on the criteria that judge an activity to be worthwhile and meaningful, even if it does not contribute to employability or the needs of the economy. Those activities and relationships that cannot be defended in terms of an economic contribution are being devalued and neglected. So this section highlights our codependency to work in a sort of socially assessed way. Because society has standardized the idea of work, people are coerced or feel obliged to work because being a worker, someone who works, you know, exhibits some sort of morality. This section mentions how gratifying work, work that we're interested in is a quote unquote fantasy as we're given little opportunities to showcase the work we want to do, uh, the work that keeps us connected and contributing to the world. This section mentions how job growth facilitated to support the economy actually contributes to more harm in our environments, our planets which we inhabit, and doesn't actually solve the issues we are currently facing. And trust me, I'm a first account of this. <laughs> I recently got a temp job printing alphabetical letters on Topex, I kid you not. And it bothered me that while I'm doing this job, we had to throw half the bags or more away because they weren't either straight or flat enough to print on. All of this material, all of these tote bags were being thrown away to who knows where, the atmosphere where we're experiencing global warming and climate change in a world we continue to produce and discard waste. Instead of there to be immediate positions to save the world, 
there are immediate positions to destroy it. Wonderful. The section lastly mentions how the obsession to commodify and profit in work has diverted us from the activities that can be meaningful and worthwhile. You know, like paying attention to climate change and the state of bettering our world directly, you know, because we're working. The section goes on to mention that work is the foundation of our morality. It raises the question of this idea of work and how it and how work can be accepted as true work in society. On page 14, it kind of puts these ideas together saying, it would be senseless to dispute the fact that most of us experience a powerful need to work. What we can dispute, however, is the celebrated prominence of work in the cultural, ethical, and political life of advanced industrial societies. What is baffling from the perspective of works critics is the notion that the activity of work should continue to be valued more than other pastimes, practices, and forms of social contribution. In 1883, from his cell in St. Pelagi prison, the French author and son-in-law of Marx, Paul Lafargue, I think, famously wrote a pamphlet entitled The Right to be Lazy. In the pamphlet, Lafargue attacked the widespread belief in the duty and sanctity of work. He wrote, a strange delusion possesses, possesses the working classes of the nations where capitalist civilization holds its sway. This delusion drags in its train the individual and social woes which for two centuries have tortured sad humanity. This delusion is the love of work, the furious passion for work, pushed even to the exhaustion of the vital force of the individual and his progeny. It should, ha it should perhaps be noted that Lafargue was writing satirically as a provocateur more than a scholar, yet his contribution is worth dwelling on because it contains a number of elements that are unrepresentative of the critique of work presented in this book. The first point of contention is Lafargue's reference to the delusions of workers and their apparently crazy desire for work. I would suggest that to work diligently is not necessarily to labor under a delusion. As workers, our choices and behaviors are shaped and limited by a specific set of moral, material, and political pressures, which is to say that the social system of advanced industrial societies is constructed so that working is often the only way that most people can meet their needs. This includes material needs for food, clothing, shelter, and also more complex psychological needs, such as the need for social recognition and esteem. Emphasis on the sad humanity part though, because what's sad is that we have to work to acquire basic needs. They call what we get a quote unquote living wage for a reason. It's in our face that we are in a system of slavery. History has exclaimed it. The dead presidents we sprint to obtain every day have had some part of it during their time in history and oddly still to this day do. It's weird. An emphasis on the duty and sanctity of work because we chant this idea of being employed as if it is our religion, our identity. As Lafargue states, it really is a delusion for this eagerness to work. So much so that we allow this delusion to infiltrate our whole lives with our pursuits in educating ourselves, not for ourselves to simply acquire knowledge, but so that we can be utilized as workers. Work has permeated our sense of life so much that we teach our kids from an early age to be something, to literally aspire to work, not so they can pursue their own goals, but simply and honestly so they can hopefully survive and that's what this is all about <laughs> there were some parts earlier in this chapter that mentioned how far we've come in affluent industrialized societies that we should now have time to rest um frayne mentions john maynard keys for a moment and his idea that the 40 hour work week would be reduced um by now for sure so that we could rest because we came so far in technology but you know the pressures of our modern world threaten us quite literally threaten us to work 
Work was also regarded as a curse in ancient Greece, where it represented a base and menial form of activity. Work was disdained because it symbolized necessity, the enslavement of humans by their bodily need for survival, and it was not something that free people should be forced to perform. It was instead designated to slaves, persons who were cut off from society because their labors excluded them from those pursuits considered to be more worthy of a citizen, such as politics, art, and quiet contemplation. Doesn't this sound familiar? The freedom of Greek citizens to participate in intellectual and political life was to be earned by subjecting others to necessity by force. Hannah Arendt wrote that, condemned to a life of toil, the slave's degradation was a blow of fate, and a fate worse than death, because it carried with it the metamorphosis of man into something akin to a tame animal. We're about to introduce you to Americans, desperate for you to know that they exist. Across the country in Kansas City, we meet Terrence Wise, another American who believes you build a life on hard work. He leaves home at 5.30 and returns 16 hours later. He records the beginning of his day. Just like everybody in America, heading to work, trying to take care of my family. Good morning. How you doing? When we meet him, he has two jobs at fast food franchises. One at Burger King, a second at McDonald's. It takes him eight buses to commute to and from his work. There's three more buses to go. Thank you. And there's a big change in the fast food worker. Back in 1980, the majority of fast food workers were teenagers. But today, 75% of these workers are in their 20s or older, a third of them with children. The American people, some may look and say, it's something you didn't do right. And they think, OK, well, you should have stayed in school, or you should have did this. Well, look, I'm working. I have a family. We're at where we're at in this life right now. This wasn't the life that Terrence had planned. He says he was once a smart kid in high school dreaming of the University of South Carolina, but he had to help with family bills. I've been at uh, Burger King, what, 11 years now? $8 an hour after 11 years of service. And yet after all those buses, all those hours, he says no vacation time, no benefits. You go into these McDonald's or any restaurant and you, you notice the smiling faces. But when he leaves, he goes home to little food of his own, or no lights, no water. And it's, it's hard to see that through a smiling face. Terrence points out his hours can be reduced, so his income isn't guaranteed. One of the hardest things, watching the leftover food at the end of the shift. What do they do with the food that is left over? At where, the where I work, the food is thrown away. Two years ago, a worker at another store posted this on YouTube. You see, this is all the food we have left at the end of the night that we have to throw away. When we meet Terrence, he has already become a passionate advocate at the center of the national movement called Fight for 15, arguing for an increase in the federal minimum wage from $7.25. I know with $15 an hour, if it started tomorrow, I would only have to work one job. Then I would have an opportunity to go to work and then go to school. The top companies in the fast food industry made combined profits of $6.6 .6 billion in 2015. While one study shows 52% of all their employees are getting some form of public assistance. Is this a way taxpayers are subsidizing the industry? Nobody wants to get food stamps. I want to go in and pull out my cash and buy my food and, and, and have insurance through my job. And again, he says, a little more makes so much difference. To go see a movie. I haven't been to the movie since The Matrix. And I don't know if you know how old that movie is. Yep, this is our stuff. There has always been income inequality in America, but as we said, today it's more extreme. Take Silicon Valley, the high-tech companies with the golden names, where employees get free food, any kind, as much as they want, free dry cleaning, gyms on site. And right there, all around them, thousands of other people also working very hard in the shadows. One of the most prominent studies of the history of attitudes towards work is Mar Max Weber's, or Weber's classic, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Originally published in 1904, Weber or Weber's analysis focused on the cultural forces that helped us to shape or helped to shape capitalism. 
highlighting the historically emergent nature of the modern attachment to work. Weber compared modernity with what he termed the traditional society in which people moderated the amount of work they performed in accordance with a well-defined set of needs. And the traditional or pre-capitalist society, work was only tolerated insofar as it was necessary. A man does not by nature wish to earn more and more money but simply to live as he is accustomed to live and earn as much as necessary for that purpose. The harvester, when offered a higher rate of pay, did not therefore dream of the extra money he could earn, but calculated how much less work he could perform in order to earn the same comfortable amount as before. His main priority was to preserve his free time rather than to increase his financial reward. And all over the country, there are business leaders saying it's time to bring new ideas to American workers and their wages. Put up charts and this is a man named Mark Bertolini, who has ideas of his own. He's the son of an auto worker, successful CEO of a Goliath company at the healthcare, 49,000 employees. Bertolini says it all has to begin with corporate leaders who want to learn the lives of their workers. Where do they live? And what are their lives like? And it took me six months to get that data. But once I got the data, I was embarrassed. He says when he became CEO, he was surprised to discover that some of his full-time employees were paid so little, they had to go on public assistance. And I said, how can we let this happen? Here we are, a major Fortune 50 company with employees who are suffering every day to make ends meet. So Aetna raised salaries to at least $16 an hour. They're helping workers pay down college debts. And he vowed not to pass any of these costs on to the Aetna consumer. 18% of the American public actually believes corporations are good. 18%. So you know, how much lower do we need to go before we figure out this doesn't work? As capitalism developed, entrepreneurs who failed to run an effective and a competitive business went bust and the idyllic state where work was performed as a spiritual vocation eventually gave way to a bitter competitive struggle. This process of rationalization produced what Weber in the title of his essay called The Spirit of Capitalism, having established itself as a universe in which people felt destined to participate, capitalism no longer required the, part of the Puritan's values to support it. Capitalism at the time of its development needed laborers who were available for economic exploitation for conscience sake. Today, it is in the saddle and hence able to force people to labor without transcendental, transcendental sanctions. Earlier in chapter one, around page 11, Frayn mentions that work is violence to the spirit as he mentions Studs Terkel's book, Working, that describes the working lives of a range of individuals that mentally detach from work by making it somewhat enjoyable for themselves. Quote, a waitress makes the day go by quicker by gliding between tables pretending to be a ballerina. I'm sure we've all done this somehow to make the day go by faster, just daydreaming or making the job more interesting even though it is a deep source of drain. There are people who admittedly finish their work in a fraction of the time and are made to make a performance of their work, being confined to the panopticon of their work environment absolutely violating their autonomy and potentiality to dubious tasks. While we wait for our working day to end, we then have the tacit labor of recovering from said work, which is a job in and of itself, decompressing, getting food, getting rest, and preparing ourselves all over again for the next work day. And while we commit all of this time to working so that we can fundamentally survive, and hopefully thrive, use our efforts, our earnings to prove that it was all worth it by finally taking that vacation, buying that cologne, we find that the goalpost to all of the production we do all day is only encouraging us to continue this cycle of production so that we can consume all of that work so someone else can continue to make the sneakers someone else wants, all of that work done so that someone else can buy a video game that helps them forget about this real world for just a moment. All of that work so we can find some tangible meaning to whatever it is we've been doing. 
via material goods we work to consume to collect some sort of relic some sort of souvenir showing the efforts we put in work so that we could finally purchase make some use of our earnings indulgence and escapism far from being cultural taboos are relentlessly encouraged in modern capitalist societies but always with the drawback that their enjoyment requires us to heighten our commitment to work in this account mass consumption has not killed the work ethic but simply augmented it taking the place of religion as society's chief distraction from work's more troubling realities eric olin wright writes let us begin with a simple and disputable observation the world in which we live involves a juxtaposition of extraordinary productivity affluence and enhanced opportunities for human creativity and fulfillment along with continuing human misery and thwarted human potential the commentaries introduced here which have all questioned work's future are components of or at least consistent with the broader project of critical social theory which has always begun with Wright's indisputable observation. The overall goal of critical social theory has been to submit processes of social development to scrutiny reflecting upon the obstacles they might pose for the flourishing of human capacities whether these capacities are physical, artistic, intellectual, social, moral, or spiritual. The critique of work is usually thought of as a Marxist tradition, but in truth, a number of its key themes emerged before Marx in the work of early utopian writers such as Charles Fourier, William Morris, and Thomas More. Fourier, for example, believed that work had the potential to become a main source of gratification and the fullest expression of human powers, but was troubled by the rift between his ideal and experiences of the real work provided by industrial capitalism. He referred to the mills and factories of the earlier or early 19th century as veritable graveyards where the workers were motivated by nothing more than a joyless concern for their own survival. The latter part of this section goes on to reference Karl Marx's idea that work is only a means of basic necessity. Frayn elaborates our obligation to work to mainly attribute to private interest and also how technology should have allotted us more free time, referencing again John Maynard Keyes who believed by the year 2030 people will be working no more than 15 hour weeks. To what extent should society tolerate the unchecked growth of the economy? To what extent does it remain rational to uphold the work ethic as a cultural ideal? If society is ever going to realize the true benefits of technological development, we need to engage in a political discussion. In Marcuse's words, we need to talk about how society's technological and intellectual resources can best be used for the optimal development and satisfaction of individual needs and faculties with a minimum of toil and misery. It is these emphatically moral and political questions that define the terrain of critical social theories after Marx, with writers trying to figure out why, in a time of unprecedented technological possibility, people's lives were still characterized by toil and repression. Just like Keynes, many critical writers found it profoundly irrational that society would continue enforcing a need to work, even in the midst of abundance. Marcuse pointed to the absurdity of the situation in Eros and Civilization, where he argued that the repression experienced by people in the modern age is an artificial or surplus repression. The word artificial is used here to suggest that the necessity, need to survive, that pushes us to submit large portions of our lives to toil is no longer a harsh, inevitable fact of our existence in nature, but the imposition of an irrational and unjust social system which not only distributes the available resources unevenly across the social hierarchy, but also manufactures new needs in order to warrant the extension of work. Okay, so basically this section is saying there is some intent for us to work this hard and this miserably. 
This idea that we are still supposed to work this hard, hustling every day to survive is a force, a social construction meant to disenfranchise us on purpose, okay? It really doesn't get any more clear than that. We literally have the resources, technology, the sense to make, do something more efficient and worthwhile in our world, but we are confined to bullshit jobs. And we have to get into that book too in the future because David Graeber in his book details how there are jobs literally created and sustained just to control people. People working these jobs know that their jobs have no real contribution or utility in the world and talk about how this is so prevalent in our neoliberal system. I've been in a variety of BS jobs myself. <laughs> I remember working at this job. Um, it was like a gutter company. And... It was just the most mundane job. I just got it like somewhat right after the pandemic or like right after I finished this work from home job. I was like at this office space for the first time since the pandemic. And I was just like, what is the priority here to really just sell gutters to people like the gutters that you put on people's houses? And I was a call center representative. So I guess I was making outbound calls to like get customers uh, acquire customers um, and it was just the most ridiculous thing I was just like of all the things that we could be doing we're selling gutters so when I ended up breaking or my car broke down um, <laughs> I tried to work from home for a few days and I did I was able to log in and use my user ID take phone calls make phone calls from home I was doing my work from home but nobody noticed um, it wasn't until a few days later that HR realized I wasn't in the office because I guess they were taking attendance or something so like yeah I got on the phone with HR and they were like well we're gonna have to fire you because you're not physically at the property you haven't been at the property for days so I'm just like <laughs> it's wild it's like they needed this surveillance they needed this control like even i would even though i was able to do my work from home it's like my presence my physical body was expected in order to be accounted for that says a lot i did not have the freedom to do this work in a more efficient way saving gas saving space saving energy this this all being beneficial me working from home to not just myself but subsequently to everyone oh no no there's a force to be in the work environment to be seen to be watched to be accounted for like any other number This first chapter got into it there was a part I didn't really get into but brain brings up again the idea of job creation and how we now live in a time that people are forced to work so exhaustively they hardly have time to cook for themselves clean for themselves and all the other basic duties now we offload our daily and basic chores to DoorDash drivers house cleaners and so on because we're at work and this adds to the unnecessary job creation keeping everyone in this cycle of work one person's job shouldn't create another unnecessary one especially if all that time required to do said person's original job can be reduced so that that worker can do basic duties for themselves instead of us to work less after getting our work done we spend the rest of our time at work doing emotional labor pretending to work having uncomfortable conversations with employees. We commit to 40 hours a week or more every week and hardly have the energy to do anything for ourselves except prepare for work the next day again. As Frayne summarizes on page 43, in recent years, there has been a growing awareness of the ecological implications of never ending economic growth. Marshalling the swelling body of scientific evidence, the ecologist Tim Jackson suggests that capitalist societies cannot possibly hope to sustain their current rate of production without major ecological consequences. 
Jackson points to well-established bodies of research on the depletion of vital natural resources, the loss of biodiversity, soil pollution, deforestation, as well as that mother of all limits, climate change, in order to illustrate his conviction that endlessly expanding the economy in order to provide work has become an increasingly unpalatable strategy. So work for work's sake is really not giving. It's not giving us time to live our lives in a fundamental, transcendental, and ethical way. And it's not giving at all in our world as we are continually taking, ripping, and burning our world alive just so we can conform to the idea of work in the first place. Can we just not? This doesn't work. So in this first chapter of David Frayne's refusal of work, he details how working is an essential ethic in our mindlessly working society. That this idea of work, not work that is gratifying, but imposed work is made so that people conform and this conformity is cultivated out of our means to survive. The only reason people do the work they don't find gratifying to begin with is so that their basic needs are met, leaving less free time for self-expression, discovery, and preservation. Frayne reflects on times in the Puritan era where work was sought for spiritual enrichment, and now, in today's world, it is a means for us to survive, and people in modern society work every day to require riches as opposed to in earlier times when people simply work to make their keep. That is no longer the case. And it is moreover not the case today for someone who has to work 40 hours a week or more every week and is not getting paid enough to live. Frayne later details that this identity of work in our lives is more than merely our struggle to make ends meet to simply survive. Work is in place to systematically maintain toil and misery in our lives for private reasons, for social and political motives. We live in an age where technology has evidently afforded us the time to be free from the bounds of work, yet even in tech-based, computer-facing positions, many people are still required to show up to work facilities or are inappropriately monitored while working through their devices or in the office environment. The chapter exclaims the absurdity of the abundance of jobs or work we would still be doing in this modern age, that the jobs being created now are only done so for economic opportunities and because there are so many people devoting their time to work, they must offload their household and personal duties to others, creating more work when they can and literally is less work. It's a matter of the time committed to work that has disabled many people from participating wholly in their basic lives. Lastly, to kind of glue things together, Frayne imagines that human capacities and real social utility can be discovered when we break our conventions to the idea of work, which only typically generates economic relevance in our society. Frayne wants us to tap into the question of what kind of society do we live in and highlights our longing to contribute our work in the world in a meaningful, fulfilling, and benevolent way that, that doesn't always have to be commodified or reduced to economics. He reflects on Marx and other philosophers who wanted us to think about creating a good life and what that means now. How we can evaluate what a good life can be now that we have the utilities, utility to create that for ourselves. That was a lot. I'm sorry. It's late at night and um, I did not expect this to be a whole 50 something minute video. Who knows how long this is now. But my last question is, what is stopping us from not working anymore why do we continue to work now that we've read in this chapter there are bs jobs created on purpose for the sake of control maintaining social and political hierarchies so that we feel obliged to work only to survive despite the fact that our work contributes to ecological disasters that many people are very unhappy in their dubious jobs that we know we can do other better things why do we continue to get in our cars and commute to the hell in which we need to uproot that reminds us every day we work to live and do not at all live to any sort of productive, enriching, wholesome work. It's about damn time we stop working and be real loud about it. It's giving antinatalism and anti-work because they are honestly like tied together. I'm going to do videos on each chapter because work is so related to our feelings of antinatalism. This chapter quite plainly mentions how work now serves no personal, ethical, or global benefit, but instead keeps us in bondage to our political state, 
so that we don't have time to question, be upset about the current state of things, and instead subjugate our time and energy to shady occupations that only exist so that we can acquire the means to survive and continue to make the rich richer. This is what we spend around 33% of our days doing, working, our lifetime, working, and let us not forget about the tacit labor to recover as well so that we continue to work. This life is mostly work, not gratifying work, not contributive, world-changing work, but monotonous, vacuous work. We hated our damn selves, so we shouldn't be bringing other people into this cog of nonsense. We need to question and refuse these conditions of quote-unquote work that literally limit us before contributing another life to this world of work that is literally taking our own lives every day, literally.